When a child is born, all you want is for them to be healthy. However, for a lot of parents, this just isn't the case. Congenital heart disease affects almost 1 in 100 babies and is one of the most common birth defects around the world. I want to further explore what it's like to live with heart defects and what it takes to treat such complex heart conditions. I'll be speaking to health professionals as well as the parents of those who, like me, are battling CHD. I speak to Dr Mike Harris who specialises in fetal diagnosis. He explains how babies can be diagnosed in the womb from as early as 20 weeks. We have a good understanding of what the normal heart should look like in a baby and the heart uh, is usually formed very early on. It's usually done by about seven or eight weeks of gestation so a lot of the time before ladies even know that they're pregnant the heart is pretty much formed and from then on it just continues to grow. Um, uh, and so we would expect all the normal structures to be there from very early on and in fact we can see a lot of those normal structures very early in the pregnancy from about 12 or 13 weeks. We have a good idea now of what normal should look like and what we're always trying to do is, is see is there something that's not normal. Uh, a lot of the time that's obvious if there's a significant problem but a proportion of the time we see things that are probably okay but you can't be completely sure of. And so we like to see those ladies a few times during the pregnancy and often after the baby's born. I'm Sophie, I'm 25. I had Olivia when I was 20. She is now four and started school in September. We went to the 20 week scan and they told us that they couldn't see um, her face and her heart properly and that we needed to go back in two weeks. So they didn't actually tell us then that there was anything specifically wrong. Um, but when we went back, um, we were scanned by the specialists and that was when they found um, the defects in her heart and we were sent over to Glenfield that day for scans um, and the specialists scanned it. And what was it that she had been diagnosed with? Um, so she has tricuspid and pulmonary atresia. Dr Aidan Bulger, a consultant cardiologist at Glenfield Hospital, tells me more about Olivia's condition and how it's treated. The pulmonary atresia, that means there's no valve connecting the heart to the lungs. So the blood has to get to the lungs another way. Um, whilst the baby's just been born, um, it, has a, it has its own connection uh, called a duct, but that duct can close off quite quickly after birth. So the clock is ticking for the surgeons to go in and actually put in a shunt. So that's a connection from the main body artery into the lung artery, so the lung artery can get a blood supply, and that duct will close off naturally. Once the shunt is in place, um, the patient's more stable. The next stage would be to have a more permanent blood supply to the lungs because the shunt is really a temporary measure um, and, that, and that's the glen. So we use a vein which would normally drain back to the heart but we connect that vein to the lungs instead um, and that starts uh, that, and that's the second stage of the procedure and that will drain the blood from the top half of the body back to the lungs that means the bottom half of the body is still going back into the heart, whereas it should be going into the lungs. So the third operation, that's the Fontan operation, that's where we connect the blood supply from the lower half of the body to the lungs. Um, and that's a slightly more complicated operation, and that's the third operation we do. So last May she had um, an operation called the Fontan, um, where it was just a completion of the previous two surgeries. The operation on her heart actually went as well as it could have done, it was everything there was perfect. But the next day, um, they actually asked me if I wanted a cuddle, and I hadn't, we hadn't, she'd not been out of bed or anything, and so I said, yeah, of course. So I was sat on the chair, and um, they lifted, the nurse lifted her out and put her on my lap, and um, all her levels just started dropping. They came and did a scan, and saw that there was, her lung had collapsed, um, and there was something pressing on it, but they couldn't quite see what it was. The next thing I know, they were chucking us out of ICU and operated on her yeah. in ICU. They didn't even take her around to theatre. They oh, opened wow. her up um, there and then. And they, the surgeon found a blood clot, which was the size of his hand, that had collapsed her lung. Um, so she then, he removed that and cleaned her all out, um, did her up again. But then she was kept ventilated for a couple of days to give her a rest. So, not every heart surgery is straightforward, nor does every heart surgery go to plan. Dr Sanjeev Nachani, a consultant paediatric intensivist, tells me more about working with heart patients in intensive care. 
if you ask a surgeon and the, the surgical colleagues I work with, what percentage um, of each role is responsible for the ultimate outcome, the surgeon will probably tell you 50% is what he or she does and the other 50% is what happens in the intensive care unit. So uh, the intensive care team play a crucial role, not just in the immediate recovery, but the long-term outlook of each and every child, baby and adult that we look after. The newborn baby has quite phenomenal powers of recovery and that also includes children who, hours after having had major art surgery, are sitting up and looking around as if nothing ever happened. So they are very strong. Dr Nachani also set up Healing Little Hearts, a charity which enables a team of surgeons to operate on children in poorer countries. I set up Healing Little Hearts uh, in 2007. Uh, as I said, I've been in Leicester over 20 years now. And having established the intensive care unit at the Glenfield Hospital and the Leicester Children's Hospital, I wanted another challenge. I wanted to give something back. I wanted to leave a legacy. Because I'm a British Indian, um, I'm from originally from India, and I know the gross inequity in healthcare, but particularly access to curative, life-saving heart surgery for children, not just in India, but in the developing world. And therefore, I set up Healing Little Hearts with a view to take teams of doctors and nurses to various parts of India, Africa, Malaysia, Mauritius, and beyond to perform heart surgery on babies, children and adults born with congenital heart disease for free. We've been uh, serving children across these countries and continents for the last 10 years now and our activity is skyrocketing and we've operated on over 1100 children including 281 children in the last year itself. So after a slow start established in the model now uh, our activity has started to skyrocket and so so far this year we've already performed, we've had seven trips abroad to date. It's an eye-opener, it's, it's a completely uh, shocking experience because they don't have the National Health Service. They are very poor countries, uh, therefore it means that whatever little money the government provides for health care is used up in basic health care and basic antibiotics and nutrition and immunization and those sorts of things. There's virtually no money left over to provide curative heart surgery for these hundreds of thousands of children born with congenital heart disease. And therefore, the outlook for those children is very, very poor. Many, many children, many thousands of children, particularly in Africa, languish in poor health because uh, they have no access to heart surgery. Uh, and many millions die uh, because of this tragedy, in my opinion. Find out more at healinglittlehearts.org.uk. Heading back to Leicester, not every heart defect can be detected in the womb. Mother of two, Stacy, shares her story about two-year-old George, who was born as normal, but, following breathing and heart troubles, was rushed to Glenfield Hospital at only six weeks old. It was that night the consultant came to see us and said that what he had was an AVSD. So he'd have to have lots of tests as well, because it's more common in kids with Down syndrome. Yeah. So they did a lot of other tests as well. I think I knew he didn't have Down syndrome, but we were worried waiting for okay. all the other you know, genetic testing to come back as well. An AVSD, that has a hole between the two collecting chambers and usually a hole between the two pumping chambers. And then that will need again an open heart operation and the surgeons will use a patch inside the heart to close um, the two holes that are there. Um, and that's usually done sort of with, you know, around six months of age. Um, but can be done earlier. Again, relatively straightforward surgery compared with some of the other procedures that we do and it, and it more or less returns the heart to a normal state. In November 2015 he had his main repair. It was horrible waiting for it but we knew he needed it to get better. But when they phoned and said he was back and it had all gone to plan, that was like, sorry, that was um, that he was made it and that it had all gone to plan was like the best. If it wasn't for for the staff, I don't know if I would have got through it to be honest, because I was in full on panic. Even though it was such a horrible time, a scary horrible time, seeing the stuff that they do, trying to look up the good points of why this happened to us and why it happened to George, and we think that that's one of them, to see such amazing things that still go on. An important factor of having a heart condition is, well, living with it. It's important for adults and children alike to understand their heart condition, and what it means for them. 
children's cardiac liaison nurse, Mary McCann, tells me more. I have been doing cardiac liaison since um, 2003, April 2003. Um, fantastic job. My specialist remit is transition. Um, when I say to children and to parents, do you know what transition is? They look at me like, it's teaching children from the ages of about 11 up until they hit the adult um, teams to be knowledgeable and confident so that if they're in a situation that they're prepared for it, you know, that they've got their last clinic letter, that they've got a copy of their ECG because their ECG will be normal for them but somebody who is not used to seeing um, a child with a congenital heart's ECG, they're going to be thinking, oh, that's abnormal. What, what's the matter with that? If you have a copy, they can see, actually, this is normal for me and it's not abnormal. And teaching them that, yes, you have got a heart condition, but that doesn't mean that you can't have a good life. Yep. That doesn't mean that you can't go to university, get a job, get married. I love my job, all of it. It's a real pleasure that people allow me to be part of their lives. Um, and if they're worried about something, they'll call me or they'll email me um, and to see the children because some of these children that come through this unit I actually nursed as children on the intensive care unit so to see them grow and to thrive you know just make me feel old sometimes when they come back to clinic I'm like what how old are you again <laughs> makes you feel really old but it's lovely you know and that they remember you um, yeah, that you're part of their lives and you see them grow and thrive and do well for themselves. It's, it's fantastic. Despite their life-saving work, Glenfield's heart unit is at risk of being closed down, along with two other heart centres in the UK. NHS England claims that Glenfields aren't performing enough surgeries to a high enough standard to remain open. I want to find out how those who are working at Glenfields and those who have been treated there feel about NHS England's decision. We're not very happy with the way that it's been portrayed to the public about, you know, suggesting that we don't make the standards. Um, we've been absolutely clear with NHS England, we've been clear and we've done media interviews and spoken to patients that this is not about the quality of care. The outcomes at Glenfield are as good as anywhere else and in some measures of quality we do better than other places. So we're very proud of that track record. NHS England have suggested that one measure of quality is the number of operations that you do. We seem to be confusing quality with a standard of number of operations and the two things are completely different. We're the fastest growing centre in the UK so we're doing more cases year on year on year and some of the bigger centres have sort of reached a plateau if you like, they're not getting any bigger. So our argument to NHS England is why would you close a centre that is getting bigger year on year? They'd still be an outpatients department, they'd still have their outpatients here. Um, that wouldn't go. Um, the only issue would be if patients needed to have an intervention, either a cardiac catheter intervention or a surgical intervention, then they would be referred to the nearest centre. And they say, oh, well, parents will go anywhere. Well, yes, parents will go anywhere. All right. But why should they need to go anywhere when we've got a perfectly fantastic centre here? If you take this away from them, then they don't have a choice, do they? We have a choice. The choice is here. If you take this away from them, they don't have a choice, do they? They have to go wherever that nearest centre will be, depending on whether they've got a bed available. Glenfield, I think... Um, is a special place. It holds a special place in lots of people's hearts, literally. Certainly patients, families, parents. It's, I guess it's one of the smaller units, which means we feel a bit more like a family, I think. And we, uh, we think of most of our patients as sort of members of the family. We are very um, committed to them, very interested in their lives. And, uh, you know, I think all of us have a huge admiration for what parents and children and young people go through uh, in terms of being diagnosed with a heart problem and then having the treatment for it. Um, and I think all of us feel that. We feel uh, a huge respect for the families that, that come past us. We huge, feel a huge responsibility to, to do the right thing for them. Um, and that's certainly what I've found 
working here. Well, if this idiotic decision was carried through, uh, then there will be a huge detriment effect to not just people and, and children and their families in the East Midlands, but we'd serve children from all over the country, particularly for our ECMO service, which is an international service. We get children for ECMO, this artificial bypass machine, which we have pioneered in Leicester. Uh, we get children from Ireland, Sweden, etc. So it would affect the entire country, uh, but particularly the children of the East and the West Midlands. They'll have to travel much further afield. Uh, and that will compromise their care without a shadow of a doubt. Not just children with heart defects, but sick children needing support for various other problems in their body as well. It's the community that is Glenfield. Um, like I said before, they're like a second family to us. Um, and they've been there through some horrendous times for us and they've provided so much support and you, get, you build a relationship with them and she's four and a half now, so, well she's nearly five, um, so that's five years worth of relationship building. They save so many lives and even unfortunately the ones that don't make it, even their parents are still like, we know that our, that our child had the best possible care. You know, I just can't understand why they'd want to shut that place down. It's it's unbelievable, absolutely unbelievable. Due to the snap general election, proceedings regarding Glenfield have been pushed back. We will now have to wait until mid-July to find out the fate of this heart unit's future. Only time will tell.